I groaned and rolled over as my hand groped blindly for the cell phone that was playing the Marines hymn. You know the song, the one that starts out, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. My hand finally closed around the object that had woke me up from my sleep. Opening one eye I looked at the display and saw that it was my younger sister Jill calling. Hey sis, I hope there's a good reason for calling so early, I growled. Jake, we need your help, my sister's voice said. I was instantly fully awake. Okay Jill, what's the problem, I asked. Jake, Christy's here and she's really scared. She didn't move away like I thought. She's been held against her will. The hackles on the back of my neck rose as she talked. She said she tried to escape once before but she was caught and taken back. He knows we are friends and he might come here looking for her. I was about to tell Jill to come to my house but instead I told my sister to take Christy to a roadside rest stop near to my house. I wanted to make sure Christy wasn't being followed. I quickly dressed and hopped into my pickup and sped down the driveway, pausing only long enough to allow the security gates to open. From here it was a straight shot down the highway to the rest stop. I pulled in and stopped behind the idling 18-wheeler which was the only vehicle there. Reaching into the glove box I pulled out a pair of binoculars and hopped out. Even though the sun had just begun to rise it was light enough to see. From this location I would be able to see the road I knew my sister would take. It wound down a distant hillside and connected with the highway I sat alongside. This was the Texas Hill Country just west of Austin. Within 10 minutes I spotted my sister's red Mustang coming down the hill at a rather fast clip. Yep, yeah, that was my sister. She always has had a bit of a lead foot. I kept the binoculars trained on the hillside watching to see if they were being tailed. As soon as they came to a stop I walked over to Jill's car. Both front doors of the car opened and the two females stepped out. I think my heart skipped a beat when I looked at my sister's passenger. She wasn't what you would call classically beautiful. Instead she was the blonde blue-eyed cheerleader that all the guys in school had the hots for, slender athletic body with a perky pair of curves. I had only met Christy one time before at my sister's house. That was just before Jill had told me that her friend had unexpectedly quit her job and disappeared. Jill says you have a problem. I said questioningly to Christy. I was seeing this guy and he has kept me locked up in his house. He wouldn't let me leave. I got away once before but I only made it a couple of miles before they caught me and took me back, Christy replied. I don't know how they found me because I was hiding. It seemed like they knew where I was. As she was talking I noticed a choker style chain around her neck. It had a small black box hanging on it like a pendant. It looked oddly familiar. I had a flash, it was like the one I had on my dog's collar. It was a GPS tracking device. Christy, where did you get that chain around your neck? Tony gave it to me. He had it put on me and told me that I was never to take it off. Let me see it, I said and stepped over to Christy. I turned her around and pulled the necklace up so I could inspect it. It was a solid chain with no clasp. Reaching into the sheath on my belt I pulled out my trusty Leatherman. Opening up the pliers I used the wire cutter to snip the chain freeing the necklace and pulled it from around her neck. You won't be needing this anymore. Jill, take Christy and wait for me at my house. They jumped into the Mustang and Jill peeled out. I remained behind deep in thought considering what I should do with the chain in my hand. I was pretty sure that the box on the choker was a GPS tracker and Christy's captor was using it to keep track of her. I was just about to drop the chain and stomp on the little black box when the engine of the big rig revved up as the driver prepared to pull out. Thinking quickly I stepped up behind the trailer and tied the necklace to the handle latch. After the semi had pulled out I waited with my binoculars trained on the road my sister had approached from. I was just about to give up when I spotted a black sedan moving down the hillside at a high rate of speed. Sliding behind the wheel of my pickup I pulled out of the rest area and started driving in the direction the big rig had taken. It took almost 20 minutes for me to get it in sight at which point I stayed back about a mile behind him. It was only minutes later when the black sedan sped past me. The car's windows were tinted and I could only just make out that there were two passengers but I couldn't see their faces. The black car raced on and passed the truck then dropped back again. I followed along for another 10 miles and observed that the sedan stayed behind the truck. I reckoned my suspicion had been right. The black box was emitting a tracer signal and they were following it. Satisfied, I made a U-turn and headed back home. 
Jill and Christy were sitting in my living room when I walked in. Christy's hair was damp from having just taken a shower and I could tell my sister had been in my closet as Christy was now wearing one of my button-up shirts. Being 6 foot 2, my shirt came down to just above the knees of the 5 foot 7 blonde. She had the sleeves rolled up so her hands could stick out. I had to admit, she looked damn cute dressed like that. Christy, I'm pretty sure you are safe for now. I need you to tell me everything you can about who was holding you, I said. His name is Tony Ross and I met him at a nightclub six months ago. He seemed really nice at first and he would take me out to a lot of expensive restaurants. I guess it was three months ago that I agreed to have dinner with him at his house. I didn't think anything was wrong until I told him that I wanted to go home. At this point tears began to flow down Christie's face and I could tell she was having a hard time talking about this. I gently urged her to continue. She said that Tony had told her she wasn't going anyplace. She would be staying with him. When she got upset and tried to walk out the door he had beat her and locked her in a room in his house. That was when he put the chain on her. After that he would use her for his carnal gratification whenever he felt like it. Christy said that he made her write a letter of resignation to her employer and that he had his men clean out her apartment. Tony had gone to great lengths to make it appear as if she had moved away. She said he was rich and had a big house, but she didn't know where he got his money. And there were always two or three big guys with guns around all the time. The first time she had escaped two of the goons had found her and had taken her back. Tony had beat her again. He told me that he had some business associates coming over today and I was to entertain them and do whatever they said, Christy continued. Last night he got drunk and passed out and I was able to sneak out again. I made it to Jill's house and told her I needed help and now I'm here. Jill had sat with her arm around Christy as she cried and told us her story. I could tell my sister was visibly upset by what she heard. Personally I was seething inside. Jill, take Christy to one of the spare rooms to get some sleep, I told my sister. I need to make a phone call. Christy's tears had started to dry up now and she looked up at me and gave me a smile. Thank you, Jake. As the girl stood up. I watched them disappear down the hall, I stood up and adjusted the slight distension in my jeans and went into my home office. Closing the door behind me, I sat at my desk and called up Lyle. Lyle was a buddy of mine that I had gone to high school with. He worked for his father who owned a large security company. They offered a range of services. From providing bodyguards to installing security systems. As part of the services they also performed background investigations on people. After exchanging pleasantries I got to the point of why I had called him. I wanted him to find out as much as possible about Tony Ross. By the time I returned to the living room my sister was sitting alone waiting for me. Christy is in the spare room. I think she was asleep before I closed the door. Poor thing, I can't even imagine how horrible this has been for her, sis said. I know what you mean. I hear about cases of women being kidnapped and held captive in the news from time to time but I never expected to meet one, I said. Are you going to call the police? Jill asked. That is a real option, but first I want to see what I can find out about this Tony guy. I'm positive that the chain she was wearing had a GPS tracker on it and if what she said about the hired muscle with guns is true then this guy could be in real trouble. If she talks to the police she might be opening herself up as a target. I saw a look of horror flash across Jill's face. What I want you to do is to run over to the mall and buy some clothes for you and Christy then come back here. Do not go back home. That tracker will show that Christy was at your house for a while and they may be watching your house. Okay, Jake, Jill said. It'll take me at least a couple of hours to get everything and get back. After she had left, I went to the back door and let my dog in. From what I could tell, Lucky was a German Shepherd Lab mix. I called him Lucky because I had found him tied to a tree where someone had left him. He was gaunt near starving to death and was lucky that I had found him. I had brought him home, fed him and took him to the vet and he had made a full recovery. Lucky was a good dog and pretty friendly, however he could be protective if he sensed danger. He nuzzled my hand and then went and lay down to take a nap. Jill had been gone for almost two hours and I was in the kitchen fixing lunch when Christy came out of the bedroom. She walked to the kitchen door and peered in looking around. Where's Jill? She asked. I could see she was worried. She ran to the mall to buy some clothes. She'll be back soon.
Christy appeared to become more nervous. After what she had been through I could understand that being here alone with me was the cause of her worry. I wanted to go to her but wisely stayed where I was. Christy, I said softly. You are perfectly safe here. No one will make you do anything you don't want to. You are not a prisoner you can leave at any time you want. I just want to help you if you will let me. Christy listened to my words and I saw the tenseness in her shoulders begin to relax. That lasted for about three seconds. Lucky had heard Christy's voice and came to investigate. As dogs tend to do, he sniffed at Christy's bare legs. When she felt the cold wet nose she turned around to see my dog behind her. Christy shrieked and in two leaps had crossed the kitchen grabbing my arm as she hid behind me. I was fighting not to laugh. Lucky just sat down and was looking at us with a seemingly bemused expression. That's Lucky. Don't worry, he won't bite, I said, leaving out, unless I tell him to. I got down on one knee. Come here, boy, I told Lucky. Standing behind me Christy placed her hands on my shoulders and I felt her grip tighten as Lucky came over. He sat down in front of us and looked up at Christy with his head cocked to one side. Gradually Christy released her hold on my shoulder and put her hand forward. Lucky stuck out his long tongue and licked her fingers. Once they had made friends I told her to have a seat at the table and I finished preparing the food. We had just begun to eat when I heard the security panel beep signaling that the front gate was opening. I knew that my sister was back. Jill came in carrying an armload of bags and dumped them on the couch and joined us for lunch. While I cleared the dishes my sister took Christy and let her change into some of the new clothes she had bought. Christy was still a striking woman when she came out, but I preferred seeing her wearing my shirt. I had just returned to the living room when my phone rang. I excused myself and went into my office to take the call. It was Lyle calling with a preliminary report. He said it hadn't been hard to start coming up with information on Tony. Lyle told me that Tony Ross's real name was Antonio Rossi and he was suspected of having ties to organized crime. Even though he had his hand in a couple of legitimate businesses he was thought to be part of a drug smuggling operation. More disturbing was that he was a person of interest to the police in the case of another missing young woman. As of yet the law had not been able to collect enough evidence against him to prosecute him on any charges. Lyle told me he would fax me all the information he had and would continue to probe further. I thanked him for what he had found so far and sat back to think about what he had told me. Finally I returned to the living room. I sat across from Christy and Jill and told them all I had learned. I could see the looks of concern grow on both their faces as I spoke. I think this guy is really bad news, I said summing up. Oh my god, what am I going to do? Christy moaned. You could go to the police, but I think that would be a mistake. Right now it would be your word against his and he has the money and lawyers to probably get off scot-free. Then you will have exposed yourself and it sounds like he has the resources to make you disappear without implicating himself. For now you are safe here. I would suggest lying low and giving me time to work on a solution. It's up to you, I told her. Christy looked at Jill helplessly. Christy, you can trust Jake. He's a good man. There is no one else I would ever go to if I needed help. I'm sure he can help you, my sister said. Her words made me proud, but I had to wonder if I could live up to them. Okay, Jake, I admit I'm scared, I don't know what else to do. I'll trust you, Christy said. I don't know what I'm going to do yet or how long this will take, but I will do whatever I can, I said, trying to be reassuring. I left Christy and Jill in the living room and returned to my offices where the faxes from Lyle had finished printing. I studied them carefully, not liking what I read. Using Google Earth I brought up the address for Tony and studied the satellite view. It showed a large house on about 5 acres and was on Lake Austin. It was apparent that he was wealthy living there. This was prime real estate. Jill and Christy prepared dinner that night and we turned in fairly early. I was up early the next morning and had breakfast ready when the girls got up. After we had eaten I told them that I was leaving for a while. I figured by now that Tony knew that Christy had slipped the leash and I wondered if they had figured out she had been to my sister's house. Jill had told me that Tony had come to her house one time with Christy, so he knew they were friends. I decided to take my Harley Sportster rather than the pickup and set out to drive by Jill's house. As I drove down her street I saw a black sedan parked two houses down on the opposite side of the street. 
I rode at a leisurely pace making sure not to look at Jill's house as I went by. When I passed by the black car I could see one man sitting inside. The windshield wasn't tinted like the rest of the windows and the guy inside the car wasn't very friendly looking. As I was wearing a helmet with a dark face shield, I wasn't worried about him seeing my face, but my fear about Jill's place being watched was proven true. Once out of sight of the black car I sped up and raced my bike back home. When I walked in I found Christy sitting on the couch. Lucky was laying beside her with his head in her lap. He glanced over at me sheepishly as Christy stroked his head. Lucky knew he wasn't allowed on the furniture. Instead of snapping at him I chuckled. Actually I was a bit jealous. I wished it was my head in the cute blonde's lap and she was running her fingers through my hair. I felt a shiver run down my back at that thought. Jill, who had been in the kitchen, came out bringing me a cup of coffee. I took a seat in the chair opposite the couch and told my sister to sit down. I'm afraid that things have taken a turn for the worse. Tony has figured out Christy was headed for your house. I just drove by your place and it's being watched, I said to my sister. Oh god, no, this is all my fault, Christy said, beginning to cry. No it's not your fault. You didn't know this would happen. You are the victim here. This is all Tony's fault. But this means that we're going to have to leave here. It will probably be only a matter of time that they find out that Jill has a brother and they might come here looking for either of you, I told them. Where are we going to go? Jill asked. Lyle's family has a place on the lake that is really secluded. I'll give him a call, I'm pretty sure he'll say we can stay there. While I do that you get your stuff and put it in my truck. What about my car? Jill asked. We're going to leave it in the garage. That flashy sports car is too easy to spot. Jill nodded her head and hurried off with Christy to pack their clothes. I went to my office and called Lyle and gave him an update on what I had seen this morning. He not only immediately agreed to let us stay at his place on the lake but said he was sending a security team over to set up cameras to keep an eye on my house. I gave him the entry code to the gate and told him I would leave the door unlocked for them. I hurried to my room and threw some clothes in my bag. I then went to my gun case and put on a shoulder holster with my 9mm Beretta and took out my AR-15. I had trained with the M16 so was very adept with the AR-15. Jill came into the room and looked at me questioningly. It's better to have a gun and not need it, than to need a gun and not have it, I said. Jill nodded and picked up the bag with my clothes as I put some ammo in a smaller bag. I loaded our bags into the floorboard of the back seat of my crew cab and Lucky jumped in. We climbed into the front seat and headed out. I had been to the lake house a couple of times fishing with Lyle so I knew the way. It was only 30 miles from my home. To get to the lake house you had to cross through a private ranch which included getting out and opening and closing three gates. It really was secluded and off the beaten trail. No one said a word as we drove. We were all lost in our own thoughts. The girls were clearly impressed with the lake house. It was large, with four bedrooms and all modern furnishings. Jill and Christy looked around while I unloaded the truck. Lucky ran around outdoors sniffing at everything, stopping occasionally to lift his leg to mark his territory. Once I had everything inside Jill called me from the kitchen. Jake, there is only some canned food in here. We're going to need more, she said when I walked in. Yeah, I should have thought of that. Tell you what, there's a country store just down the highway. I'll drive over and pick up some stuff. You two can make yourselves at home while I'm gone. Hang on there, Jake. I'm not going to live off of beef jerky and potato chips. I'm going to give you a list, Jill said. I sighed and shrugged my shoulders. It wasn't like that was all I was going to get. I was going to pick up some beer to go with it. I patiently waited while my sister wrote me a list of things to buy. The country store was owned by a local rancher and featured a meat counter. All you had to do was specify what cut you wanted and they would slice it off the fresh prime beef while you waited. Along with a couple chickens and some nice thick pork chops I stocked up on enough to last us for a week. I found most of the items Jill had put on her list and settled up at the cash register. While I unloaded the pickup up the girls went through the bags and put the groceries away. In the last sack Jill pulled out the small white styrofoam container and popped off the top to look inside and shrieked when she saw the big Canadian nightcrawlers squirming inside. I laughed as I walked over to take them out her hand. It's bait. Thought I might do a little fishing while we're here, I said. Thank God. 
I was hoping you weren't expecting to put those in a salad, Jill giggled. Jill and Christy used the cold cuts I had bought to make as some sandwiches while I brought out three rods and reels from where Lyle's family kept them stored. We took the sandwiches and a cooler down to the pier at the lake edge. I set up the folding lawn chairs I had brought down and while the girls got out the food and drinks I baited up the hooks and tossed out the lines. There was no way they were going to touch the worms, so that was my job. I set the rods in the holders mounted to the side of the pier and sat down to eat. I started talking with Christy and managed to get her to open up some more to me. As she talked, Lucky sat next to her chair with his head in her lap as she pet him. I think he could sense that Christy was hurting and he was trying to comfort her in his own way. I learned that she was an only child and that her father had left when she was just a child. Her mother had passed away a year ago and she had no other family. Christy had moved here nine months ago and her only friend was Jill. That explained a lot about why she had become Tony's prey. Single woman, new to the area with no family nearby and few friends, easy pickings. It also matched the profile of the other missing woman. Christy then asked about Jill and I. Despite being friends with my sister for six months, prior to her being kidnapped by Tony, they hadn't really shared much about their personal lives. I admitted to her that Jill and I were trust fund babies. Our mothers was the only daughter of wealthy parents. When they were alive, my grandparents had doted on my sister and me and had set up the funds for us. Jill and I had gone to college and I had joined the Marines after I graduated. Jill had found a job. I had spent the last three months since my discharge basically decompressing from the rigors of military life. And even though I could live comfortably off my trust fund, as long as I didn't go hog wild, I was still looking for something to do with my time. I just wanted to make sure it was something I would enjoy. Just as I was finishing telling Christy about my life her pole bent over almost in half. She shrieked as I jumped up and grabbed it to set the hook. I held the rod in one hand and pulled Christy to her feet with the other. I put the pole in her hands and told her to reel it in. She was struggling to get the fish and so I stepped up behind her and put my arms around her to help. I showed her how to raise the pole and then reel in as she lowered it. When she lowered the rod her bottom would press back against my groin. I was fighting a losing battle to keep my personal rod from rising. Finally we managed to get the fish in and pulled a six pound channel cat up to lay flopping on the deck. Lucky stood to one side barking excitedly at the big fish. Whereas I was all for filleting our catch, my sister and Christy protested and begged me to set it free. With a roll of my eyes I removed the hook and reluctantly put the fish back in the water and watched it swim away. I baited her rod again and tossed it back out. A short time later Jill's line bent down and she brought in a smaller fish that was also released. That was the extent of the action for the day and as we walked back to the house I was kidding about being outfished by two girls. I didn't mind the jesting as this was the first time I had seen Christy laugh. But I soon found out that it was going to take more than catching a fish to heal her. That evening I decided to grill up some steaks. I had just placed the meat over the fire and realized I hadn't seasoned them. I went back into the kitchen and Christy was at the stove stirring a pot when I walked up behind her. The seasoning was in a spice rack over the stove and as I stepped up behind her I spoke her name. She hadn't heard me coming and screamed and turned as her hand flashed out and slapped my face. She had a look of pure fire in her eyes. Tony may have damaged her spirit but I could see he hadn't broken it. As soon as she saw it was me standing there her face changed to shock. Oh god, Jake, I'm sorry, I forgot where I was. I didn't mean to hit you, she said pleadingly as tears filled her eyes. It's okay, Christy, it was my fault, I shouldn't have come up behind you like that, I replied. Christy reached up and stroked my stinging cheek. It was almost worth being slapped to have her caress me. I had to fight the urge to pull her into my arms and kiss her. Maybe the day would come that I could hold her but now was not the time. She needed time to get over what Tony had done to her. I settled for taking her hand and kissing it as I again reassured her I was not upset. The next five days passed slowly. We left the lake house only once and that was to take Christy to a doctor to have her checked out physically and for any STDs. While cabin fever had not set in there was still the prevailing feeling that we were being held captive because of Tony. The only upside was the time I spent with Christy. She continued to become more relaxed in my company and would even join in with my sister in teasing me about little things they seemed to find amusing. 
The most eventful thing to happen occurred on our third night there. Jill and Christy had said they were going to turn in and I went out to take Lucky for a late walk. We had gone down to the pier and I stood and admired the night sky. It was lit with the twinkling of stars that you only see when you were away from the city with its ambient light. The moon was just rising and reflected over the still dark waters of the lake. That was not the only heavenly body I was to see that night. As I was returning to the house I noticed movement in one of the windows and looked over to see Christy standing in her room. With the light on in her room she couldn't see out into the dark. She was wearing a robe and drying her hair with a towel. I stood rooted to the ground as she let the towel drop and then undid her robe. It slid down her shoulders and I gasped at the sight of her unclothed. The beauty of the moon paled in comparison to the vision before me. Her damp blonde hair fell past her shoulders ending above a perfect pair of curves. She reached down to the bed and picked up her nightgown, clothing herself, was I able to move forward again. I fought the twinge of guilt I felt about watching her, rationalizing to myself that I had not set out to intentionally spy on her. Besides, I don't know any man who would have looked away from such a sight. I stayed in touch with Lyle daily and even though he had much of his company's resources trying to come up with something to use against Tony, they had no more luck than the authorities. The news on our sixth day of exile was more disturbing. Lyle had cameras placed both inside and outside my house which transmitted to his office through a secure satellite uplink. They had caught two men scaling my fence. Even though they had not broken into the house they had gone around peering into all the windows. It looked like Tony had linked me to my sister and thereby to Christy. Jake, we've been here for a week, Jill said over breakfast. Maybe we should just move away someplace. Somewhere Tony can't find us. Hun, I don't know if it could be that simple. If Tony really does have ties to organized crime they may find us wherever we go. That's why the government has the witness protection program. There has to be a better way. We just have to be patient, I said. What I didn't tell her was that I had gone so far as considering going after Tony myself. I couldn't help but think that if this was Iraq and Tony was identified as an Al-Qaeda leader he would have been a sanctioned target. But this wasn't Iraq. Maybe I should go to the police, Christy said. I shook my head. No, that's not a good idea. Even if they took him and he would get out on bail and then there's no telling how far he would go to stop you. Jill and Chrissy let the subject drop but the decision of whether to stay or leave was taken away that night. Jill and I were watching the late news and Christy had stepped out back for a breath of fresh air. Lucky, who had been laying at my feet, sprang up and ran to the back door barking furiously. I jumped up and ran after him, throwing the door open. Lucky tore off chasing after a dark figure disappearing into the gloom towards the pier. I gave chase, drawing my gun as I ran. As the pier came into view I saw my dog leap through the air and a scream rang out. This was followed by a loud splash. I ran onto the pier to see a speedboat racing away and someone thrashing in the water. I let my pistol clatter to the boards as I realized it was Christy in the lake. I dove through the air and knifed through the water surfacing next to her. I wrapped one arm around her and swam for the shore. When I could stand I lifted her and carried her onto shore. Christy wrapped her arms around my neck and cried. Dropping to my knees on dry ground I held her shaking body. It was a good five minutes before she could talk. Thank you for saving me, Jake, she said between sobs. As much as I would like to take credit it was Lucky who saved you, I said as I looked over at my dog sitting next to my clearly shaken sister who had followed me out of the house. Lucky had a piece of material in his mouth that when I removed it from between his teeth that turned out to be the back pocket of a pair of pants. I almost chuckled when I saw that it was coated in blood. I knew someone was going to have trouble sitting for a while. I stood up pulling Christy to her feet and passed her to my sister. I told them to wait while I retrieved my pistol and then instructed them to follow me to the house. I sent Lucky in first and then followed him. The house was clear. Jill, get Christy into some dry clothes then pack your stuff as fast as you can. We have to get out of here, I ordered. They hurried off to do as I said. I ran to my room and threw my clothes in my bag and grabbed my rifle and the ammo. I had my stuff loaded in the truck and was standing guard with the AR-15 when they came out. Jill put her suitcases into the back and after loading up Lucky we peeled out down the dirt road. When we hit the highway I made a sharp left heading away from Austin. Fifteen minutes later my phone rang. Jake, this is Lyle. 
I'm afraid your position might be compromised, he said hurriedly. Yeah, I know. We were paid a visit and they almost got Christy, I replied. What the hell happened? Lyle groaned. One of the men I had kept an eye on at your place must have blown his cover. The police found his body dumped in an empty lot. He had been tortured. It had to be Tony's apes. Are you guys okay? Yeah, we're fine. We're on the road. Not sure where I'm heading but I will call you later, I said. I hung up and told Jill and Christy what Lyle had told me. This is all my fault, Christy said plaintively. Christy was sitting next to me and I put a hand on her leg and gave her a gentle squeeze. Sweetie, that's the last time I want to hear you say that. Tony is a psychopath and that is not your fault. Okay. Yes, Jake, she said softly. I was about to remove my hand from her leg when she surprised me by placing her hand over mine holding it there. A few miles down the road I saw a pair of headlights in my rear view mirror as I crested a hill. The next hill I topped the lights appeared to be closer. A chill ran down my spine. I turned off my headlights, relying on the light of the moon to guide my way and drove until I saw a dirt road off to the right. I quickly turned onto it and stopped under some trees a hundred yards off the highway. I got out taking the AR-15 with me. Stay in the truck. I just want to make sure we are not being followed, I said. I climbed into the back of the truck and laid the rifle over the back of the tailgate. Less than two minutes later I saw a dark car speed by on the highway. I couldn't tell what kind of car it was from that distance. I was pretty sure they couldn't see my truck in the darkness of the trees. Breathing a sigh of relief I hopped out the bed of the truck. The girls peered at me when I slid back behind the wheel. I think we're all right, I said. Jill and Christy blew out a breath of relief. After starting the truck I checked my GPS navigation and saw that the Caliche road we were on belonged to the county. If we followed it we would come out on another highway 20 miles to the north. It was a safe bet that no one would be looking for us there. As I looked at the map the name of a town on the highway I was heading for rang a bell. As I drove on, Christy laid her head on my shoulder and I could tell by her breathing that she soon fell asleep. Jill was using her rolled up jacket for a pillow and had her head up against the passenger side window. As I drove through the darkness I came to two conclusions. First. I had to find somewhere safe for Christy and Jill in second, it was time to take action. One way or another Tony was going down. An hour later we pulled into the little town I had seen on the GPS. I found a church with a parking lot in the back where we could park without being seen from the road and pulled in. The girls stirred when I turned off the engine. We're going to stay here until morning. Lucky can curl up on the floorboard and one of you can stretch out in the back seat and the other one can use my lap as a pillow. I was happy when Jill took the back seat. I leaned my seat back and Christy laid her head on my leg. I couldn't resist stroking her head and I choked up when she put her hand over my knee and squeezed my leg. I had only really known her for just over a week but I was falling for her. The sun peeking over the horizon woke me. It took a few seconds to realize where I was. I rubbed the sleep out of my eyes and looked down to see Christy's head still in my lap. I suddenly realized that my morning was pressing up against her cheek. I heard her lightly groan in her sleep. Reaching down I gently shook her shoulder. Christy started to raise up and I opened the door and slid out of my seat hoping she didn't see my stiffness. I walked around the side of the truck and let Lucky out then stood stretching. Jill woke up when I opened the door and stepped out to join me. Reaching back into the truck I grabbed my smartphone off the dash where I had put it last night and connected to the internet. What you doing, Jake? Jill asked, trying to look up the address of a buddy of mine. He got his discharge a little over a year ago, but I remember him telling me that this was his hometown. I was striking out through the usual methods until I thought of the county tax records. I put in the name Kowalski. There were three listed in the county but only one in this town. I think I got it. Let's load up, I said. I called Lucky and put him in the back seat. Jill got in next to Christy and I put the address into the GPS. Fifteen minutes later we were pulling into the driveway of a large farmhouse on the outskirts of town. As I got out of the truck an older man came out of the house. Can I help you, the big man asked. Maybe, I was looking for Stanley Kowalski, I replied. The man turned back towards the house and yelled, hey, son. Someone here to see you. A minute later a mountain of a man came to the door. He looked out and I watched his face light up. 
He came barreling down the stairs and lifted me off the ground in a bear hug. God damn, Jake, it's good to see you, he said after setting me back on the ground. Great to see you too, Bear, I said laughing. Bear was the affectionate nickname he had been given by his fellow marines. He stood six foot five and was almost as wide at the shoulders as he was tall. What brings you to this neck of the woods, Bear asked. We have a bit of a problem, I said nodding to the girls in the truck. I could use your help. Hell yeah, buddy. Anything for you. First, is there somewhere I can park my truck out of sight? I asked. Yeah, pull it into the barn over there, he said, pointing to the big building back behind the house. I pulled into the barn and we all got out. As soon as Lucky hit the ground he bounded over to Bear wagging his tail. The big man got down on one knee and the two became instant friends. Jill came over and whispered in my ear. Bear, the ladies need to use the head, I said. Sure thing. Y'all come on in the house, he said, leading the way. We entered through the back door into a large kitchen. Inside were his parents, the man who had met us when we pulled up and an older woman. Bear introduced me to them and I introduced Jill and Christy. Bear told his mother that the girls needed to use the bathroom and she led them away. Bear poured us a cup of coffee and we stepped out on the back porch to talk. He stood silent while I told him about everything that had happened. Jesus Christ, Jake, that's some shit, what are you going to do now? Bear asked, that's where I was hoping you could help. I need somewhere safe for the girls to stay. I was hoping they could stay here while I go back and take care of the problem. Of course the ladies can stay here. But what are you going to do when you go back? He asked. Haven't got that figured out yet, but I've got to do something. I said, shaking my head. Well you ain't going alone. I'm going with you, the big man said seriously. Bear, I can't ask you to get involved in this mess. You ain't asking. I'm telling you I'm going. I knew Bear and from the look in his eyes I knew there was no arguing with him. All I could do was shake his hand and thank him. I knew from experience there was no one better to have on your side than him if the shit hit the fan. Bear called his dad out and explained the situation to him. His dad promised to look after Jill and Christy and told us to be careful. I then called Jill and Christy out to talk while Bear and his dad went back inside. The Kowalskis are going to let you stay here. No one will think to look for you here so you will be safe, I said. Where are you going? Jill asked, afraid of the answer. I'm going back to settle this once and for all. They both heard the finality in my voice. Their eyes filled with tears that spilled down their cheeks. Jill stepped forward and hugged me fiercely. When she moved back Christy took her place and squeezed me in her arms. Be careful, Jake. Please come back safe, she choked out. I returned her hug and kissed the top of her head. I'll be back, I promise. As I released my hold on Christy, Bear stepped out of the door. He had a bag of clothes in one hand and a Bushmaster assault rifle in the other. He wore a shoulder holster with a Desert Eagle 50 caliber Magnum pistol. Bear never did anything in a small way. We'll take my ride. They will probably be looking for yours, Bear said. I retrieved my clothes and AR-15 from my truck and loaded them into Bear's big black Humvee. Like I said, Bear didn't do anything in a small way. Lucky jumped up into the back seat and we headed for Austin. As we drove we began to talk about what we were going to do. I suggested that we give Lyle a call since his people were keeping tabs on what was happening. Lyle got excited when I told him I was on my way back with Bear. He said whatever we decided to do to count him in. Bear and I found a motel on the edge of town and he went inside to the front desk while I stayed out of sight in the Humvee. Bear got two rooms on the back side of the motel and once we settled in I called Lyle. He hurried over and looked up in awe when I introduced Bear to him. We talked for hours and in the end we decided that we would grab one of Tony's goons. If we could get him to talk we might have a chance of acting against Tony. We spent two days going over the plan. Lyle's people had kept watch over mine and Jill's houses. They reported that one of Tony's men would drive by a couple times a day to see if anyone had returned. We set our plan into action on the third day. Lyle's people were eager to help since one of their own had been tortured and killed by Tony's men. To pull this off we were using three vehicles. Lyle drove one car, Bear and I were in a van and two of Lyle's people were in the third car. When we saw the black sedan coming Lyle pulled out in front of him. Bear and I in the van pulled in behind him and the third car with two of Lyle's employees tailed us. 
As we approached my house, Lyle came to a stop and I pulled up alongside the target vehicle. The third car stopped behind our guy pinning him in. Bear leapt out of the side door of the van and with one punch from his massive fist knocked out the driver's side window. He pulled the stunned goon through the window and literally threw him into the van and jumped back in. As I pulled away one of Lyle's men in the tail car got out and drove the empty car away. The snatch had gone off with a hitch. Bear quickly had our hostage disarmed and handcuffed. I had Lucky leashed to the front seat and he was almost rabid trying to get at our captive who cowered in sheer terror. I drove fast, following Lyle to an abandoned warehouse. As we approached, the loading doors opened and we drove inside as the doors closed behind us. We came to a screeching halt and Bear dragged the terrified man out and attached his handcuffs to a chain hoist. A few seconds later he was standing on his tiptoes with his hands pulled up over his head. When he looked around all he saw was five men in black ski masks surrounding him. We extricated his wallet and his license identified him as Vincent Moretti, Vinny for short. We started to interrogate our prisoner, but once he had gotten over his initial shock he clammed up. He was either very loyal to Tony or more afraid of him than he was of us. After a half hour of getting nowhere Bear asked me to let him convince Vinny that we were serious. I told him I had a better idea and instructed one of Lyle's men to strip our hostages pants off. I was standing behind him and when his bare ass came into view I saw a bandage on his right cheek. I ripped it off and saw the teeth marks on his ass. This was the guy who had tried to carry Christy off from the lake house. Now I understood why Lucky was trying so hard to get at him. I went to the van and led Lucky out so that he was standing inches away from the half-naked man. Lucky was snarling and snapping as I held him back by his leash. The sight of slashing teeth so close to his shriveled privates broke Vinny and he began to babble. He was eager now to answer our questions as long as I kept Lucky away from his family jewels. We learned two vital pieces of information from him. First he confirmed that Tony had killed the missing woman in a fit of rage and that he and a guy named Gino had buried her in a remote wooded area. His second piece of useful information was that Tony had a delivery of Colombian cocaine set to arrive the next day. There, Lyle and I moved to the other side of the warehouse to discuss what we had learned. We all agreed that this had gone better than we had hoped. As we talked I came up with an idea how we could bring Tony down without firing a shot. I had Bear handcuff Vinny to a chair and we put a bright light in his face. He couldn't see that we set up a video camera that was focused to only show his head. We again asked Vinny questions which he now freely answered. The rest of my plan was going to require a lot of luck and some precision timing. There, Lyle and I left Vinny under guard and the next morning drove to the opposite side of the river from Tony's property. We found an empty lot which was wooded and worked our way through the trees until we were above the river. Scanning the opposite side I saw my assumption was right. When I had used Google Earth to check his property it showed the house sat 30 feet above the water. That 30 feet was a cliff face and there was no wall on this side of the property. What we did note is that there was a 2 inch pipe that ran from the river up over the cliff. Many people along the river used pipes like this to pump water up for irrigation. Satisfied with what I had seen, we went back to the motel. I explained my plan to my two friends and they had to admit that it was risky, but if we pulled it off it could possibly solve the problem. Much of the plan was in Lyle's hands to arrange. He left, taking the video of Vinny's confession with him. Bear picked us up a pizza and later that evening I called Jill and Christy. I had phoned them every day to let them know we were safe. That night I was able to tell them that with luck Bear and I would be coming back in a couple of days. The next day we made one quick reconnoiter of the area where the drug exchange between the Colombians and Tony's men was to be made. Then we waited until late afternoon. This part of my plan required a lot of manpower. In addition to Bear, Lyle and myself, Lyle recruited eight of his people who worked as bodyguards. All of these men had been in the military at one time. We all met at the warehouse and went over the plans. Vinny had given us the location where the exchange was to be made. It was on a dirt road in a remote wooded area. Shortly after dark two cars would approach from opposite directions. After using their headlights as a signal the two men sent by Tony would get out of their car with a suitcase containing money. At the same time the two Colombians would get out of their car and unload the cocaine. When both sides were satisfied they would make the exchange and drive away. 
Tony's men then would take the drugs to another location and prepare it for distribution to either local dealers or shipment to other locations. At no time would Tony be directly involved with the drugs. We split into two teams of four and hid in the trees on either side of the road. Right on time we saw the two cars approaching. They stopped and flashed their headlights in the prearranged code and got out of their cars. As they approached each other we sprang into action. From both sides, with guns in hand, we took the four men by surprise. In order to prevent mistaken intentions Tony's men and the Colombians had left their weapons in their cars. Seeing eight armed men in ski masks, they didn't put up any resistance. It only took minutes to have them all handcuffed laying face down in the dirt. Lyle radioed his other three men who came speeding up in three vans. Tony's two goons were loaded into one van and the two Colombians into the other. The two vans roared off with one driver and two of the security team guarding the prisoners. They headed for the abandoned warehouse that Vinny was being held at. We checked out the drugs and found there was 20 kilos of cocaine. The suitcase had 50 bundles of $100 bills. With 100 bills to a bundle there was a half million dollars. We put 5 kilos of the drugs in the suitcase full of money back in the trunk of the car the Colombians had driven and the remaining two security team members took the two cars back to the warehouse. This left the one van into which Lyle, Bear and I loaded the remaining 15 kilos of drugs into. Now came the last risky part of the plan. The three of us drove the van to the river that ran past Tony's house. We met another of Lyle's men who was waiting for us with a small boat about a mile upstream of Tony's. It was just big enough to hold three of us, the drugs and our guns. We pushed off and let the electric trolling motor soundlessly propel us along. The only light we used was from the dim handheld GPS navigator which let us know when we were below Tony's house. We drifted along the cliff until we found the irrigation pipe. Lyle was the smallest of the three of us at 5 foot 8 and 145 pounds. He used the pipe to scale the cliff and then dropped a rope down which I used to climb up. Bear tied the drugs to the end of the rope and then we pulled the 15 kilos up behind us. Bear stayed with the boat. This part of the plan was to plant the drugs on Tony's property. We figured the security in the house would be too tight so we ruled that out. There was a cabana behind the house next to the pool however. Moving stealthily through the dark, Lyle and I made our way to the cabana. Wearing black clothes and black ski masks it would be hard to spot us in the dark of the night. We leapfrogged each other moving from tree to tree. Lyle and I froze when we were only yards from our objective. The back door to the house opened and an armed man stepped outside. I saw the flare of a lighter as he lit a cigarette. We remained frozen in place for the next 10 minutes before the hired muscle tossed down the butt of his smoke and went back into the house. Again, cautiously we crept forward. We were in luck when we reached the cabana. It was unlocked. There was only one large room. Lyle remained at the door keeping it open just a crack while he peered out watching for any movement from the house. I located a closet and stashed the drugs inside, covering the three 5 kilo packages with some towels I found inside. Again we quietly crossed the property and made our escape, rappelling down the cliff to where Bear was waiting in the boat. Only when we had pushed off and Bear had turned on the trolling motor did we breathe a sigh of relief. This had been eerily similar to some of the missions I had been on while in Iraq. The trolling motor pushed us back up the river to our waiting van. It was now time to set the final part of my plan into motion. We drove back to the warehouse that now held Vinny. Tony's two couriers and the two Colombians as well as their cars. There were three of the security team members standing guard as the others had already dispersed. When we arrived back at the warehouse I had Bear bring Vinny over. Lyle had provided me with a portable video player and I placed the disc with Vinny's confession in it and showed it to him. It had been edited so that all it showed was him talking. When I told him that a copy of the disc was being delivered to the police I could tell by the smell that he shit in his pants. I then gave him one piece of advice. I told him that the only way he would probably live is to turn state's evidence and beg to be put into the witness protection program. We then left the warehouse after making sure that Vinny and the other four were handcuffed and chained so they weren't going anywhere until the police arrived to free them. Everyone involved in my plan had worn ski masks and gloves so we weren't worried that we would be recognized later or that we had left any prints behind. Our next stop was to a pay phone where I placed a call to the police. I told them to check the garbage can outside the front door of the station and they would find a package with proof of two crimes being committed. 
Before I hung up I told them they had two hours to act before the press was notified. I figured that would give them enough time to get the necessary warrants. In the package was a letter informing them of where the drugs could be found at Tony's house, the location of the warehouse where we left the five men and five kilos of cocaine, the location where they could find the body of the missing woman and a copy of the video of Vinny's confession. It would be enough to spur them into action. I didn't wait two hours to call the press. I called a local news station and asked if they would like an exclusive story on the arrest of a wealthy businessman on drug and murder charges. They were eager to get the story. I told them to send out two news crews to a general area and when the police were arriving at the scenes they would be told where to go. One of Lyle's men remained near to the warehouse and another was stationed close to Tony's house. When they saw the police going by they radioed us and I in turn notified the news station where to send their reporters. There wasn't anything more for us to do so we called it a night. Lyle went home and Bear and I went back to the motel. I set my alarm to catch the early morning news and turned in for the night hoping that everything was going to plan and this would be the end of Tony. As soon as the alarm went off the next morning I turned on the TV and sure enough the lead story was about Tony. The reporter on the scene said that the police had entered Tony's estate in force and a gunfight had broken out. Apparently one man had been killed and another wounded. I breathed a sigh of relief when they said none of the officers had been hit. The reporter went on to say that Tony had been arrested along with one other man who had not been wounded. The news then switched to a related story in which they reported that five men in handcuffs had been let out of an abandoned warehouse. I breathed a sigh of relief. I now hope that Tony had much bigger problems to worry about than Christy. As the story ended Bear knocked on my door. He stood there with a big grin on his face as he had just watched the same channel in his room next door. We congratulated each other on a job well done. I had one last thing to do before we headed back to Bear's place. Bear checked us out of the motel and we drove to Lyle's office. He had just arrived when we walked in. I had a suitcase in my hand, the one containing the money that was going to be used in the drug buy and had taken with me when we left the warehouse. I put the suitcase on Lyle's desk and counted out two piles of $100,000. I pushed one pile over to Lyle and the other to Bear and told them that was their share. I then told Lyle to split the remaining money with the men who had been involved in my plan as a reward for their help. Bear and Lyle started to protest that I should be entitled to a share of the money but I told them that my reward would come when I knew that Christy and my sister were no longer in danger. Bear and I said goodbye to Lyle and climbed back into the Humvee for the ride back to his home. We talked about how well things had gone and I had to admit it had come off much better than I could have hoped for. When we pulled up to the front of the house the front door burst open as I stepped out of the Humvee. I was almost knocked to the ground as Jill and Christy threw their arms around me in joy. Bear just stood watching with a big grin on his face as Lucky raced around us barking. I couldn't help but laugh out loud as they both covered my cheeks with kisses. Finally I got them calmed down and we all went and sat around the big kitchen table. Bear and I took turns telling everyone about the events of the last few days. I told Christy how we had grabbed Vinny and how he had the wounds on his ass from Lucky's teeth. Bear took over the story and regaled them with the part where Lucky had tried to bite off Vinny's private parts, causing everyone to laugh out loud. Christy bent down and gave my dog a big hug and was rewarded with a big sloppy doggy kiss. When we had finished our tale everyone stared at us in awe. Jill was the first to speak. What happens now, Jake? Well, I guess we'll wait and see how this plays out. Right now I think Tony has more things to worry about than us, I replied. Well, the three of you are welcome here for as long as you want, Bear's mom said. Thank you, Mrs. Kowalski. I really appreciate that, I replied. Pshaw, young man. You can call me Maddie, and this old man here is Ben, she said, nodding to her husband. Ben looked at his wife and I could see the love he had for his wife in his eyes. Jake, Maddie and I have become very fond of these two fine young ladies. You are all welcome in our home, Ben said. I really appreciate that. I'll pay you back for your generosity, I said gratefully. The hell you will, Bear said as he reached down into the bag of clothes he had brought in with him. Bear pulled out the bundles of cash and set it on the table. Ben and Maddie's eyes bugged out at the sight of the bills stacked on the table. Where did you get all that money, son? Ben asked. Bear explained how we had confiscated the cash from the drug dealers and how I had split it up among those who had helped me. 
But that's drug money. We can't keep it. It's tainted, protested Matty. Matty, it's money, I interjected. It may have been obtained through illegal means but that doesn't diminish its value. Now it has been returned to good people to better their lives. It would be a shame to let it go to waste. Matty's eyes softened. Well, I guess if you put it that way then it doesn't seem so bad, she conceded. Bear and I spent the rest of the day chilling out. The last few days had provided enough adrenaline rushes that it was nice to just relax. We made sure to catch the 6 o'clock news. The lead story was the recovery of the remains of a buried body that was linked to the arrest of the wealthy businessman from the previous day. This caused Christy to cry again as she realized just how perilous her captivity had been. She was sitting on the couch next to me and I put my arm around her and hugged her to my chest. She cried into my shoulder for several minutes. There was more good news as it was reported that due to the seriousness of the charges and the risk of flight that Tony and his men were being denied bail and would remain in custody until after their trials. After dinner that night I stepped out onto the back porch. The sun was just touching the horizon on its way down. I heard the screen door squeak and looked over my shoulder. Christy came out and walked up to me. Without speaking, she put her arms around my chest and hugged me. I wrapped my arms around her and for several minutes we just held each other in silence. Then she leaned back and looked up into my eyes. Thank you, Jake, for everything, she said and then raised up on her tiptoes and lightly kissed my lips. Before I could react she slipped from my arms and returned to the house leaving me to watch as the screen door closed behind her. I yearned to kiss her again. Over the next few days Christy and I took long walks around the farm. We talked a lot but the opportunity to kiss her never seemed to arise. It wasn't that she was distant but I was afraid to push things after what she had been through. So I had to be content to just spend time with her. We stayed with Bear and his parents for five days. One bright spot was when Christy contacted her doctor and received a clean bill of health. She was fit, at least physically. I am still worried about her mental state. I talked to Lyle daily and he reported that there had been no further activity at either Jill's or my house. With Tony in jail and no one looking for us, I felt it should be safe to go home. We said our heartfelt goodbyes to our hosts and made promises to stay in touch and loaded up my truck for the drive home. On the way we talked about Christy continuing to stay at my house, at least for now. I didn't want to let her out of my life. I also wanted to keep a close eye on my sister for a while so I convinced them both that they should stay at my house, just to be on the safe side. We went by my sister's home and picked up more of her clothes and other personal items that she needed and returned to my house. The girls got settled into the spare bedrooms. It was a Friday afternoon and Jill called her boss and told him she would be back to work on Monday. Her employer had been gracious enough to let her take the time off as she had enough vacation and personal time to cover it. Over breakfast Saturday morning Jill told Christy that she should go to work with her on Monday. She was pretty sure that if they explained things that Christy would get her job back. Christy was willing to give it a shot but didn't have the clothes to wear. The clothes my sister had bought for her were functional but not appropriate for the workplace. That's easily solved. I'll take you wherever you want and we will get you what you need, I said. I can't let you do that, Jake. You are already doing so much for me. I'll never be able to pay you back as it is, Christy protested. You can start by letting me do this for you. It'll make me happy, I said honestly. Okay, Jake, but I am going to pay you back, she said. With that agreed to, the three of them set out for the mall. Christy and Jill picked her out a few outfits and when she had chosen three Christy wanted to stop. I insisted that she get at least ten full changes. Christy tried to pretend to be upset but I could tell she was actually grateful. Most guys could wear the same couple of suits all week but I knew that it was important for women to be stylish. With 10 outfits she could mix and match and not wear the exact same outfit for a month. Of course in my opinion Christy would look good even in a burlap sack. Our shopping was done in time for lunch and I took the girls to a restaurant to eat. I sat back and watched as my sister and Christy chatted away merrily. It was nice to see Christy coming to life. She had had moments during the last couple of weeks where she had acted spontaneously but she would then slip back into a more subdued state. Of course, considering what she had been through it was perfectly understandable. With Jill's help Christy was able to return to work. They explained that Christy had been the victim of a stalker and had been forced into hiding. 
Christy said that she felt the situation had been resolved and wasn't expecting any further occurrences. No mention was made of Tony being involved. Hopefully, this way Christy wouldn't be the center of conversation, what with Tony's pending trial still being a prominent news story. As for me, Lyle convinced me to go to work for him. Mainly I would be doing background checks on the computer and phone. These background checks were usually requested by employers hiring people for sensitive jobs such as handling large sums of money or doing work that might be subject to industrial espionage. In Austin there were quite a few high-tech companies who wanted to know all they could about a prospective employee. The great thing about this was that I could do most of the work from home. Living with two women wasn't all that hard. Jill was only a year younger than me and we had always been close growing up. Having her there was much like our younger days growing up together. Christy was as sweet as could be. She helped with all the daily chores of cooking and cleaning. I just had two problems with her, having to fight from taking her in my arms and kissing her whenever she was near and wishing that it was my bed she was going to at night. Thanksgiving fell two weeks after we returned home. We invited Bear and his parents to my house and they were happy to come. I also invited Lyle but he had already made plans to spend the day with his new girlfriend's family. The Kowalskis arrived early Thursday morning and Bear's mom, Maddie, joined Jill and Christy in the kitchen preparing the meal. Bear, Ben, and I did what every red-blooded American male should do on Thanksgiving. We stayed out of the kitchen and watched football. The women served the meal between the Detroit and Dallas games. The food was delicious and Maddie positively glowed with pride when we raved over the dressing. It was her secret family recipe. Lucky sat on the floor next to Christy while we ate and I noticed her sneaking him bites of turkey. I was going to have to talk to her about spoiling the dog. When the dishes were all cleared away and the leftovers put into the refrigerator the ladies joined us in the living room. Bear and his family stayed until early evening before returning home. Over the next two weeks Christy and I grew closer. She would sit close to me on the couch and I even thought she would flirt with me from time to time. I really didn't think too much about it as it seemed to be innocent enough. The main thing for me was just being able to enjoy being with her. Jill and Christy would occasionally mention the annual holiday party their employer put on. It was being held in a ballroom at one of the finer hotels. There was dinner, followed by a few speeches and awards handed out and then the dance floor would be open. Two nights before the party the three of us were having dinner. I hope you have a suit. If not, you will need to buy one, Jill said to me. A suit? I asked, confused. To wear to the party, she said. Party? Yes, the party. You will need to wear a suit to take Christy to the party, Jill said. I had assumed that she was going to the party, but I didn't know if she was going alone or had a date. Until now there had been no mention of me going. Christy looked at the confusion on my face. It's okay, Jake. You don't have to go with me, Christy said looking downcast. What, no, ah, uh, I mean yes, I would love to go with you, I stammered. Christy perked up and gave me a big smile. The first thing I did the next day was to run out and buy a new suit. The evening of the party I was in the living room already dressed and waiting. Jill and Christy were in their bedrooms putting on their final touches when the buzzer announced that someone was at the gate. Could you let him in, Jake? That'll be my date. Tell him I'll be right out, Jill called from her room. I was a little confused as I pressed the button to open the gate. I didn't recall her saying anything about a date. I was even more confused when I opened the door. Bear, what are you doing here? I asked the big man dressed in a suit. I'm here to pick up Jill. Didn't she tell you that I am taking her to the party, he replied. Ah, uh, no she didn't. Ah, uh, come on in. She said she would be right out. We didn't even have a chance to sit down when the door to Jill's room opened and my sister walked out. I thought Bear's jaw was going to hit the floor when he saw her. My sister is a stunning woman and tonight in her black evening gown she was gorgeous, even if I do say so myself. Jill walked over to Bear and placed her hand on his arm. You look very handsome in your suit, Jill said. So do you, stuttered the big man. I mean, you're really beautiful. Why thank you, Stanley. Jake, we will meet you and Christy at the hotel, my sister said, taking Bear's arm, guiding him to the door, leaving me stunned and confused. I tried to think how this had come about. It must have started when we stayed with Bear and his family. That must be why Christy went on those long walks with me, so Jill could spend time with Bear. 
I had thought that maybe it was because she had wanted to be with me. And now that I thought about it, they had sat next to each other at Thanksgiving. Not only while we ate but afterward when we sat in the living room. As I got over the shock, I shrugged. Bear was a good man. My sister could do worse. I wasn't so lost in thought that I did not miss Christy walking into the room. I'm sure my reaction to her was every bit the equal to what Bear's had been when he saw Jill. Christy was absolutely stunning in her red gown. She wore her long blonde hair up in a sophisticated hairdo. Gliding across the floor she came to a stop in front of me and did a slow pirouette. Do you approve? She asked. Very much so, I said, regaining my senses. You are beautiful. Thank you, Jake. Shall we go? She said as she hooked her arm into mine. As I escorted Christy into the ballroom I noticed most of the men stop and stare at her. A few even got nudges from wives or girlfriends. I was proud to have been the one to be with her. We found the table that Jill and Bear were sitting at and joined them. There were two other couples at the table and I was introduced to the girls' co-workers and their significant others. Over dinner, I noticed Jill would often put her hand on Bear's arm when they were talking to each other. Once the speeches and awards were out of the way the dance floor was opened up. Bear and I both asked our dates to dance. With all the ladies in gowns they played mostly slow songs for which I was thankful. This was the longest that I had held Christy in my arms. The first time I put my arms around her I felt a tingle of electricity flash through my body. Christy molded herself to me and I was glad that I had better self-control that day. But there were several times that she would brush up against me in such a way that I knew she had to feel it. I was relieved when she didn't push me away. As the evening was drawing to a close my sister came and told me that Stan was taking her home, home to her house. I noticed that Jill never called him Bear, it was always Stan or Stanley. She said she would be safe standing there with her. I chuckled when I wondered just how safe Stanley was going to be alone with my sister. As I drove Christy home she talked about how nice the night had been and how much she had enjoyed dancing. Upon entering the house, Christy took the pins out of her hair and shook her tresses free. She turned to me and said she would like to have another glass of wine. Tossing my coat onto the couch, I went into the kitchen and poured one for her while she stood in the doorway and watched me. When I walked over to hand her the wine she coyly pointed up over our heads. I looked up and saw the mistletoe my sister had hung there. When I glanced back down at Christy she gave me a sultry smile and cocked her head to the side. I may have been born at night but it wasn't last night and I wasn't going to pass up this chance. I slipped the arm that wasn't holding the glass around her waist pulling her into me. As my lips met hers I again felt the surge of electricity course through me. The kiss started gentle, what had started slowly quickly escalated into a kiss of heated passion. When our lips parted, Christy reached out and took the glass of wine from my hand and downed it in one swallow. She set the glass on the counter and then took my hand and led me to my bedroom. We consummated our relationship, Christy clung to me tightly. I have never felt anything like it, I said honestly. Jake, you realize I'm falling in love with you, she said cautiously. That's good because I am already in love with you, I replied. Christy kissed me confirming her feelings for me. The night of dancing and love making took its toll and we fell into a deep slumber holding each other tightly. The next morning I woke, but this morning there was something different. She was with me. We stepped out and took a bath in warm water and dried each other before heading for the kitchen to seek sustenance to replenish the energy we had expended. As we walked through the living room I opened the back door and let Lucky in the house. He was pissed at me for having left him outside all night and ignored me. Instead he went right to Christy seeking her caresses which he was quickly rewarded with. Christy had become quite attached to the dog that had rescued her that night at the lake house. After breakfast we sat in the living room and talked. Christy wanted to know why I hadn't acted on my feelings for her. I answered by telling her that I was afraid that after what she had been through that she would react badly to any advances I made. Christy then talked about her time as Tony's captive. She said that she had been able to mentally detach herself during the times he forced himself on her and except for the two times he had beat on her she felt nothing. I had to admire her for her mental strength. She went on to add that Tony's penis was so small that she couldn't feel him anyway. I laughed with her at that and had to wonder about Tony as I found Christy to be exquisitely tight. It was late afternoon when Bear brought my sister back. 
They both had the look of content satisfaction on their faces. The big man gave me a sheepish grin when he walked in. He stayed and had dinner with us before returning home. Jill walked him to the door and gave him a smoldering kiss and once he was gone I looked at her with raised eyebrows. She just grinned at me and headed into her bedroom. The flaw in my plans for getting rid of Tony appeared the following week when the police showed up at Christie's place of work. Vinny had turned state's evidence and in doing so had told the prosecutors about Tony kidnapping and holding Christie. I don't think Vinny is the sharpest knife in the drawer as he had been in custody for several weeks before he mentioned her. The prosecutors were immediately interested in finding Christie. As Christie had no known address the police had gone to her last place of employment in hopes of finding a lead. They were surprised to find her there and took her in to talk to the prosecutors. There were representatives of both the attorney general's office, who were interested in pursuing the drug case in the federal courts, and the county attorney's office who were filing kidnapping and murder charges against Tony. The feds promptly lost interest in Christy when they learned that she knew nothing about the drugs Tony was dealing in. The county attorneys however were very interested in her. The county prosecutors told her that Vinnie had told them about her kidnapping. Christy realized they knew everything and she told them the story of what had happened to her. Jill had called me as soon as the police had escorted Christy out of the building and I had driven right to the police station. I was waiting for her when she was finally allowed to leave. She came running into my arms and started to sob. We both knew what this meant. The prosecutors would have to divulge to the defense that Christy would be a witness against Tony. That meant that she could become a target again. Even from jail Tony had the resources to be a threat. That also meant that my sister and I were also at risk. I held Christy in my arms doing my best to comfort her while I cursed myself for not just going ahead and taking Tony out. Now he was in the hands of the police where I couldn't get to him. Despite the district attorney advising Christy to stay in town I knew it was time to disappear again. By the time I had driven Christy back home Jill was already there. She came running over and hugged her friend. Before they could get caught up in conversation, I led them both over to sit on the couch. Girls, I want you to pack your things again. The district attorney will have to disclose to the defense that Christy is going to be called as a key witness. It's possible that Tony will take the news badly. It's time to lay low again, I said. But they said I shouldn't leave town, Christy said weakly. Frack em. They can't protect us all. It's up to us to do what we have to to survive. They will sit on this information for a few days at least and that gives us time to disappear. I will not allow either of you to be taken from me, I said with authority. I started making phone calls right away. First I called Lyle and let him know what was happening. I told him that we were going to leave the state and go into hiding, but I didn't tell him what my exact plans were. He assured me that he would have mine and Jill's houses looked after. My next call was to Bear. When I told him that we were leaving he insisted on talking to my sister. Once they had hung up Jill told me that Bear was on his way and he was coming with us. I didn't protest as I knew if he felt half as strongly about my sister as I felt about Christy he would do everything he could to protect her. I did call Bear back and told him to bring along his passport. My final call was to my parents. I talked to my dad and explained what had been happening. Up until now I had not told my parents anything about what had happened as I didn't want them to worry. He was very concerned and said he and mom would be anxiously awaiting our arrival. When my mother's parents had passed away they had left her a large inheritance. Greater than the two trust funds they had set for my sister and me. Jill and I had grown up in Clear Lake, a suburb of Houston. My father had a passion for sailing and kept his boat docked at one of the local marinas. He had taught my sister and I to sail from the time we were old enough to walk. After the passing of my grandparents, my father had taken an early retirement and my parents had moved to Palm Beach, Florida. Here he could keep his sailboat docked behind his house for easy access. Bear arrived that evening and I waited until after dinner to discuss my plans with everyone. The girls were actually excited about my idea and saw it as a grand adventure. Bear didn't seem to be quite as sure. We turned in early and planned to leave out the next morning. We took my pickup as the extended cab gave us enough room to all ride comfortably and to store our belongings in the back. We had three stops to make before leaving town. First I took Christy to her bank where she kept her passport in a security box. It was about all she had left after Tony's people had cleaned out her apartment. 
I then stopped by my bank and made a sizable cash withdrawal. I intended to pay cash and not leave a trail by using a credit card. Our last stop was at Christy and Jill's place of work. I went in with them and we had a closed door meeting with their boss. As it was no longer a secret we told him exactly why we were leaving town. He thanked us for letting him know the reason that the girls were taking off. He said, as we had no idea how long we would be gone, that he couldn't promise to hold their jobs, but to give him a call when things were straightened out. Every four hours I would switch out the driving with Bear. This allowed one of us to nap and be ready for the next leg. While I drove Christy and Lucky would sit up front with me while Bear and Jill sat in the back. We would change places when it was Bear's turn to drive. With a few stops for meals and bathroom breaks it took us a little over 25 hours to reach my parents' home. As we piled out of my truck, my parents came running out to greet us. I had to grin when their eyes grew wide at the sight of Bear. After exchanging hugs with Jill and me, my parents led us into the house. I introduced Christy to them and I think they instantly fell in love with the beautiful blonde who had captured my heart. When Jill introduced Bear they seemed to be a little unsure of him. It was only after I had time to speak to my parents alone and assure them that Bear was a man of honor and would take care of their daughter did they begin to warm to him. It was three days before Christmas and my parents were very happy to have us there with them. The day after we arrived my dad took us out on his sailboat. It was a 42-foot beauty. Jill showed Bear how to raise the sails as dad went over the navigation system with me. The boat was equipped with an autopilot that was integrated with a GPS navigation system. You could plot in your course and the boat would basically steer itself. A living person was only needed to keep a lookout for obstacles, like other boats. Once we were out in the deeper water Bear began to look a little green around the gills. He was a little queasy, but I was pleased to see he didn't lose his breakfast. Christy on the other hand was having a blast. Dad would spend a couple hours each day on the boat with Jill and I making sure we understood all the functions. Christmas day was nice. We opened presents and then Jill, Christy and mom prepared a feast for us. It was nice to see mom accept Christy like another daughter. The day after Christmas we spent stocking up on food supplies and new clothes and loading them aboard the sailboat and then had a final dinner with my parents. Early on the morning of the 27th Christy, Jill, Bear, Lucky and myself boarded the boat and set off as my parents stood on the dock waving until we sailed out of sight. I stayed at the helm until we reached deep water and then I set the autopilot. Bear took the first watch while Jill and I made sure everything was in ship shape. Jill and I split the shifts at night while Christy and Bear stood watch during the day. Jill and Bear took the forward berth as it had more headroom but Bear's feet still hung off the bed when he slept. He was used to that so it wasn't a real problem. Christy and I shared the rear berth. Christy stayed up with me for a while during my first night watch. Once Bear and my sister had turned in to get some sleep Christy came over and swiveled the captain's chair I sat into the side. After Jill had come up to relieve me I took Christy down to our berth. We each took turns preparing meals. Bear didn't eat too much the first day out, but by the end of the second day he had his sea legs and his appetite returned. Hurricane season was over and the weather was perfect for sailing. During the day the girls wore their bikinis and even though Jill was my sister I could still appreciate how lovely she was. My eyes however were mainly reserved for Christy. Lucky was born to be a sea dog. He especially loved to bark at the dolphins who would occasionally swim alongside us as they leapt out of the water. For four days we sailed southeast covering some 650 miles to our destination in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Dad had called and made reservations for us at a place he had stayed before on one of his cruises with Mom. It was called the Harbor Club Villas and Marina. It has its own private marina where we could dock in six villas for rent. Dad had managed to rent us two villas for three months. Each villa was nicely furnished and even offered Wi-Fi internet access. Once we had settled in I notified the district attorney's office that Christy was in fear for her life and would not return until the trial had started and her testimony was needed. I made it clear that any earlier return was not open for negotiation. If they had any further questions for her they could contact her through my email. We spent the next 10 weeks living in a tropical paradise. During the day we would snorkel or scuba dive go fishing, take the boat out and sail around the islands, or just hang out at the beach. Bear and I actually got quite adept at fly fishing for bonefish on the flats. 
We even got the girls to let us keep some of the fish's fresh grouper or snapper made for a nice meal. Our nights were filled with making love. It was like we were on an extended double honeymoon. Christy and I continued to grow closer every day and I could see the same thing happening between Bear and my sister. It was getting close to the end of our stay in the villas and we were discussing moving on to other islands, perhaps back north to the Bahamas when I received the notification that the prosecutors had a date set in a week's time to start Tony's trial. It had taken five months to reach this point. We restocked the boat with fresh supplies and set sail to return to Palm Harbor. I knew that if Christy didn't appear voluntarily they would issue a subpoena and she would face contempt of court charges if she failed to show. After another four days of sailing we returned to our starting point. My parents were expecting us and as soon as we were close enough to receive a cell phone signal I gave them a call. They were waiting for us on the dock when we pulled up. With six of us it didn't take long to remove our belongings from the boat. Christy and Jill helped my mother take the linens and towels into the house to wash while Bear, Dad and I sat in the living room talking. As we were telling my father about the trip I turned on my laptop to check my email. I saw there was one from the district attorney and opened it up. I had to read it twice to make sure I understood what it said. I leapt from the couch hollering in joy. Christy, Jill and Mom came running into the room to see what was happening. It's over. You don't have to testify, I shouted out. What do you mean? asked a confused Christy. Tony knew that he was facing the death penalty so he made a plea bargain. He pled guilty and received a sentence of life without parole, I said exuberantly. Christy rushed into my arms crying tears of relief. We celebrated that night. Dad even went out and bought champagne. Although we were tired from our journey it was late by the time we made it to bed and we slept in the next morning. We stayed with my parents for another three days and would have stayed longer but Bear was anxious to get back. Once again we loaded my truck for the trip halfway across the country. Not being in a hurry we stopped for the night halfway back this time. When we arrived home and opened the door Lucky jumped out and went nuts running around the yard. Even though he had done well on the trip there was no doubt he was glad to be home. Bear spent one final night with Jill before returning to his home. It took us a couple of days to get settled back in. Jill called her boss and was told that they had filled their former positions. They did have one comparable position they could put Jill in but Christy would have to wait for another opening and then reapply. Christy was visibly upset at not having a job. I took her to the side to talk to her alone. Christy, I know you're not happy to have lost your job, but I have another position that I would like you to consider applying for, I said. Oh yeah, what's that? She asked. I dropped to one knee. I would like you to be my wife. I love you Christy and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Tears filled her eyes and she dropped down next to me wrapping her arms around my neck. Yes, Jake, I would love to be your wife, she cried as she kissed my face all over. Jill came running in to see what all the commotion was about. Christy jumped up and hugged her. We're going to be sister-in-laws. Jake asked me to marry him, Christy said excitedly. Both girls started jumping up and down squealing in glee. I was forgotten for the moment but I didn't mind. I had received the only answer I had wanted and was contentedly happy. I was also not surprised that when Jill told Bear about our engagement that he also proposed to her. Nor was I surprised that she accepted. From the time we had spent in the islands it was clear they were in love. We decided to have a double wedding and Bear and I are standing in front of all the invited guests. The two most beautiful brides I have ever seen are walking down the aisle towards us and I don't know who has the bigger smile, me or Bear. Lyle is my best man and he is holding Lucky's leash as he stands next to me. I couldn't find a tux for Lucky but he is wearing a bow tie. Oh yeah, we are planning a double honeymoon as well. Dad is lending us his boat again and we are going to cruise the islands. We are going to see many of the ones we passed on our way to the Turks and Caicos Islands. Epilogue three weeks after his transfer to a state penitentiary, Tony was found murdered. It was speculated that it was a hit ordered by the Colombian drug lord who thought it was his fault that the drugs had been seized and two of his men were convicted for transporting and selling drugs. The other two men taken in the raid on Tony's property also received stiff prison sentences. As for Vinny, he just disappeared. I can only speculate that he is in a witness protection system somewhere far away.